Hey guys, thanks for watching. This was at the Be Better Golf School that we did at the Grand in San Diego. Here's Mike Padilla hitting on the swing catalyst. And it was a really cool setup here because we had the swing catalyst going and then piping into this TV so that you could come and watch what Dr. Scott was doing with the swing catalyst footage. You're going to hear Dr. Scott talk about the session and the work that he did with Colin Morikow and his coach coming up right here. It's a special move. You can see how there's basically three graphs up there. Uh, there's one, the pinkish colored one is the horizontal graph. And that's how you're kind of pushing towards and away from the target and creating kind of like sway-ish type forces. Uh, and that's one that people used to think is, you know, horrible or a, a flaw in the golf swing. Uh, if you take that away from some people, it robs them of their athleticism and their ability to hit the golf ball. So. Um, that is one of the forces we can use to hit a golf ball and create speed. Um, the other, the yellow graph is the rotational force. This is the one that's going to get us twisting or turning through it. This is probably the one that I think is the most difficult for amateurs to produce because um, it's working in this transverse plane, which is not a plane we normally move in too often doing other things. Um, and then the last one is the vertical force, uh, which is kind of the jumping force that, uh, you know, We've learned a lot about lately because of players like Justin Thomas and Lexi Thompson, the people that are literally jumping off the ground. It used to be something I remember going to golf schools in the 90s, early 90s as a junior player, um, and golf teachers would get on their hands and knees and hold kids' feet on the ground. They're like, we don't jump in this game. This isn't basketball. Um, if Justin Thomas's dad had a did that, done that to him, he wouldn't be Justin Thomas. We, none of us would know who Justin Thomas is right now because that's one of his gifts. That's what allows him to be Justin Thomas. Um, and some people, to be like 165 pounds and to but the speed yeah. that he does yeah um and i think this is what the swing college system it lets us look under the hood a bit to know what your engine is um because in some players like justin thomas it's pretty obvious what their engine is but in other players it's not that quite that obvious um i got a chance right before um the la opened to work with colin morikawa and colin i thought would be a lot of torque right because he kind of turns through it pretty well it gives both buckle point at the target as you get through it uh, his vertical forces are off the charts. His feet don't leave the ground, but he has unbelievable vertical forces. Who is that? Morikawa. Um, and the second I saw that on this thing, I was like, Rick Sessinghouse, if you ever give Colin a drill and it makes this vertical force come down, don't do that drill anymore. Because you're taking away what makes Colin Morikawa, Colin Morikawa. Right. And we really started to figure out why he is so good. So he's been top five, I believe, on the PJ Tour and stroke scanned out of the fairway with his irons for the last whatever number of years, like he's really good at that. Um, and what we're starting to find out is if you create a well-timed vertical force and you're actually pulling the handle up when it gets to about shaft parallel, that creates a big 3D flat spot down the bottom, which makes you a lot more consistent with your iron. So it doesn't matter where you get it along this arc, it's probably gonna go pretty close to where you're aiming it. Um, and I think that's his, his specialty or that's his uh, gift. And so if we started doing a drill and that started to come down, I was like, okay, we're not doing that anymore because we're robbing you of your gift. Now, um, he doesn't do too well when there's a lot of rough, because if you imagine if you have a really big flat spot along here and there's some grass in the way, then you're not quite as, probably going to be quite as successful. So we, we worked on some alterations in his technique, but that's a pretty special case. Um, but what I want to find out when I get you first get you on this plate is what is your gifts? Like what is your, the force that you do the best with? Um, and we'll kind of build your swing around that. Um, we'll probably put you through a couple little assessments to see what because sometimes people will be using a force that isn't optimal for them uh, because they watched a YouTube video or and they're trying to be very rotational when they're really not able to do that. I played ice hockey my whole life. So, and this is something that we don't really know the answer to. Like what makes your gift your gift? Is it something you're born with? Is it something that you developed over your other athletic <clears throat> endeavors? Um, I grew up playing ice hockey. So my dad tells the story that I was, I think about three years old, right? As soon as you're old enough that you can walk around without falling down. And he put me on skates and sent me out on the ice with a stick in my hand. And so that was the first athletic thing I'd ever done. I don't think I've even run before I was out on the ice. And when I'm on the ice, you kind of have to push to the side and out like this way to create speed. And so that, that pattern shows up in here all the time. And if you try to take that away from me, I'm not very good at it anymore. So what are you, rotational then, you said? No, I'm more horizontal. I go more this way because that's kind of my skating pattern. I've added a lot of rotation to my swing um, that has helped me stabilize the path quite a bit. Because generally when you go this way, that drops the club inside and I used to have six to seven degree in the out path. Yeah. So I've, I've added a little bit of rotation. I'll never get it to like two or average, but because I've tried a bunch and it never gets there. 
Um, but that just normalizes my path by a couple degrees, which makes things really good. But if you take away my horizontal, then you, you, I lose speed and I don't hit it very well. So uh, that's the thing that I think this sports plate has really helped me a lot with is realizing what in people's swings not to fuck with. Like, let's leave that alone, where sometimes you go to see somebody and they might rob you of something you're already doing very well, which is something I don't want to do. Scott, can you show them what the, the dark gray means and the gray means? Sure. So the dark, the black uh, band right here is our tour average uh, plus or minus one standard deviation. So the middle of the black band is the tour average. The top is plus one standard deviation. The minus is minus one standard deviation. If anybody got any stats in their lives? How much percentage of the population falls in that band? Which one? From one plus or minus one standard deviation around the mean. 67%-ish, yeah. Okay, so that's a lot of the PGA Tour that falls in that average. Um, and I think you know, if, you're, if you're looking at your launch monitor data and you're looking at average tour average data, it can mess you up because I'm never getting to tour average with a seven iron, so why would I even bother with that? Um, but with this, this is all relative to your body weight. So I've seen little, you know, 40 pound girls that get into her average for some of these forces because it's relative to their body weight. Mm -hmm. um, it also, the goal is not to get everything into the tour average. The only place where I think that might be the goal to be at or above the tour average is if you're a long drive competitor. I've yet to see a long driver who's not at or above the tour average in all of them. And I think it's like a Darwinian event long drive. If you're able to get all of these at or above the tour average, you can hit the ball 400 yards. If you're not able to do that, you'll probably never be a long driver. But that doesn't mean you can't hit it in the fairway, hit it close to the hole and make birdies. Because um, I would say out of the couple hundred PGA Tour players we've measured, we've only measured maybe 10 that are at or above the tour average in all of these things. Every other PGA Tour player has one or two of them that are at the tour average. And the other one is lower than the tour average. And you can actually, I've seen people raise a force and hit it worse. Um, and so that was one with Colin Morikawa. If we added more of that horizontal force with him, he started hitting it off the toe. He started seeing these hooks that she hates. Um, and that is one that was not for him. So we tried to move that one down and we tried to add a little torque, trying to leave his vertical alone um, to get him a little more gas. Because you'll see a lot of people now doing like the Kyle Berkshire thing. That was the worst thing in the world for Colin Morikawa. It got more pressure into his trail side. It got him going more this way. He started hitting hooks, which he hates. And so we're like, okay, we're not doing that. Now, how long is he trying something like that? Is that something where you try for a, a well, while? Well, that's the thing that, then, like, like, with this, tolerance. you could start to tell really soon. Right, right. So that's where you don't go down a wrong path right. too too much, I Does think. Does he know right away? Do they know right away? Don't, don't do that. Um, you can kind of tell by a tour player's face. Um, <laughs> and he's, last year, he played some pretty poor golf hitting draws. Um, but the good part about it is we tried it for, I don't know, five or ten minutes. And it started drawing, and I was like, well, that's good, because now you know how to draw, or now you know what you're doing to draw it. So if it starts to draw on the golf course, do the opposite of that. I'm going to do that. And yeah, right? <laughs> and he's like, oh, because he started to get upset when it started to draw. I was like, no, that's a good thing. You just figured out how to draw it. And so now if you start drawing it and you don't like that, we know how to stop that. Uh, so actually doing it wrong on purpose is a great way to learn. And we're probably going to do that. We call it the Goldilocks drill. Too hot, too cold, fun, just right for you. Uh, great way to practice. Yeah, you've been at this for about six years and stuff like that. Uh, and it sounds to me like that your what you address and how you address it has evolved over the time. Yeah. Can you share kind of what your your? I mean, when I first started with this, um, <laughs> I first started working for Swing Callis in 2015, and I believe that's right when Tiger stopped doing his tournament at Sherwood Country Club. And so the last one he did at Sherwood Country Club, I went up there, and I've, I've known Sean Foley for a long time. And we walked 18 holes and watched Tiger play 18 holes at Sherwood, which is five hours-ish. And at the end of it, Foley looked at me, he's like, over this last five hours, I probably asked you about, I don't know, 300 questions. I'm like, yeah, give or take, probably. He's like, you said, I don't know, to about 297 of them. And I was like, yeah, because I don't. <laughs> um, and so I didn't really try to bullshit people when I first got people on here. Like, when I first got this system at my university, I told the golf coaches, I was like, I don't really know this stuff. Like, I don't know what's good, what's bad. I see a lot of variability in players. So what I told them was, and a good way to use it was, if your player is ever hitting it great, if you have a player that's hitting it great, just shot 67, send them in. I'll measure it, I won't say a thing. Send them up. Because inevitably a month later, two months later, it's gonna go poorly and then we can come back and that'll direct our arrow to get them back a lot quicker. That's how we started with it. And then over time we started doing more and more research and or now we're getting to the point where, you know, 
we don't really have to archive what's good. We're starting to learn patterns. And what's actually really helped me recently is 18 uh, Major League Baseball teams now use our system for hitting. And so I've learned a ton about baseball hitting that's kind of bled over into golf to start to understand a, a lot more about um, how to use the ground effectively with a stick in your hand to hit something. Um, the, a lot of the Major League Baseball teams are using in their analytics now. So they know what patterns on the forces equal who's going to be best against which style of pitches. And so now they know everybody's pattern on their team and they know they bring in this relief pitcher, this guy's pattern matches best, so you're up. Are you, with, with, when, with the baseball teams, are they mostly doing it to live pitching? Or are they, I mean, I mean like a ball coming at them or off a tee? Um, I think they mostly do the pitching machine okay. when they measure it. Um, I was at the Cubs facility recently and their force plates have dings in them because guys will foul it off and it hits off the plate. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. not ideal for the technology, but yeah. uh, they're, they're still cooking. So, um, but yeah, so the Cubs, the Cubs and the Dodgers were the first two to start using it. And then it's been trickling down to, you basically go down the list of the salaries of baseball teams. It's like a have or have nots, the baseball. So we're, we're about halfway through the league in terms of the number of teams that have bought in and started to use it. It's good um, for injuries too, right? Because all of a sudden you see like the person's not loading. Yeah. You know? Well, the um, force plates, these collect to the thousand hertz. So they take a thousand pictures every second. And I don't know how many times I've had somebody hit on this plate and be like, you ever hurt your right side? And they're like, oh yeah, my right knee is killing me right now. And they're like, how did you know that? I'm like, see this when it starts to go like this. So a normal pattern of human movement is kind of like sine waves. And if it goes up here and it goes, zzz, zzz, your brain and your body are freaking out. Um, Sparks are flying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you then have a couple of options, right? You can go away and work on whatever that thing is and get that pattern back. Or you can just build your golf swing around the good side. Um, and that's where we've talked a lot about dominant leg testing for golf. Um, and what your dominant leg is can really affect what your swing mechanic should be. Um, and I think there's more to dominant leg. People used to assume that like if I had an imbalance, I always wanted to work on the weaker side to get it even. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think some people are just built to be balanced a little differently than others and uh, we can make that work for you.